Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. I do want to encourage you to check out our other podcast, including the Amazing World of Radio, over at amazing.greatdetectives.net. We follow the history of World War II, beginning with the pre-war era, and continuing through the entire conflict. And we do this through news programs, through drama, through comedy, through music, so much to listen to, check it out at thewar.greatdetectives.net and you can find all of our other podcasts over at the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio homepage at greatdetectives.net. Also, a reminder, coming up tomorrow, my live audio chat on Wisdom. You can join me 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. 5.30 5.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, and uh, we will take live questions. I expect this to go between 30 to 60 minutes, so uh, do check that out at wisdom.greatdetectives.net. But now it is time for today's episode of Jeff Regan. The original air date, April 5th, 1950, and the title is... A tree grows in Encino. My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Jeff Regan, Investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story of A Tree Grows in Encino. There was a confused redhead with cool lips and a hot temper an interior decorator who didn't want his orange trees moved, and a strange little man who hired the Lion Detective Agency to make sure he got himself convicted of murder. A real sensible case. It was about half past lunchtime when I reported back to the Lion's office to see what was on tap for the afternoon. Plenty was. Plenty in the form of a thin, haughty little man sitting across the desk from the Lion. Anthony J. had his mouth wide open when I walked in. Hey, Jeffrey, come in, come in. I, uh, I've been waiting for you. Uh, this is Mr., uh, McMurray. Mr. Jonathan McMurray. Hey, McMurray, yes. Uh, Jeffrey, he, uh, he thinks he needs our help. Uh, not sure yet, Mr. McMurray? Yes, I am quite sure. It is your employer, Mr. Lyon, who is not sure. Uh, well, now, I, I wouldn't say that, Mr. McMurray. Yours is a very unusual case. Suppose somebody tells me what this is all about. Uh, well, uh, Jeffrey, uh, Mr. McMurray... I uh, will explain my own problems, Mr. Lyon. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, you explain them, Mac. Mr. Regan, it's quite simple. I want you to prove I am guilty of murder. What? Yeah, quite simple, Jeffrey. I have murdered my wife, Mr. Regan. I've gone to the police and confessed. They refuse to believe me. It's up to you to prove I'm right. Yeah, uh, up to us, Jeffrey. Wait a minute, Fatso. Let's get all the story, Mac. You killed your wife and the police won't believe you? When? On the morning of April 3rd at 3 a.m. three years ago. Three years? You see, Jeffrey, I told you this was Mr. a Mr. Very... Lyon. Yeah. I had gone to bed early the night of April 2nd. I heard noises several hours later. I assumed they were burglars. I went downstairs, taking my gun, of course, and saw a figure breaking in. Naturally, I fired. It was my wife. Your wife breaking into your own house? It seemed that way at the time. Perhaps I was not fully awake. We all make mistakes, you know. All make mistakes. Of course. I do not believe in murder. That is why I am here. The police wouldn't believe you. Nothing but a group of incompetent, immoral civil servants. Are we not paying them to establish law and order? I ask you, Mr. Regan, are we Finish not... the story. Uh, what happened after you shot your wife? In the moment of utter weakness, I, I lost my head. I fled the city. And for three years you've hidden out. Only uh, your conscience got to bothering you. You finally decided to... Co- back... Certainly not. The woman was dead. My problem was more basic. 
down to the very roots of nature. I wrestled, shall we say, with all the evil of the world and won. Where? In San Francisco, where I had established myself in business. It was last week I decided that I must pay the price or live forever in a morass of sin. I have decided, Mr. Regan, to make an example of myself. Uh, <coughs> Jeffrey, uh, perhaps we'd better explain to Mr. McMurray that uh, we're pretty busy this season. Uh, maybe someone else... Wait a minute, Lion. Mac, did you and your wife get along? We quarreled constantly. When I married her, I had assumed she was a woman of some inner dignity and spirit. I discovered she was no better What than... was his name? I beg your pardon. The other man. There was no other man. She had not sunk that low. We quarreled about her work. It kept her out nights. Her work kept her out nights? Exactly. She was an interior decorator. Lois, that was her name. Lois was one of those soulless moderns. Form follows function, that sort of nonsense. I take it uh, you aren't modern. I, sir, am an architect. An architect of the old school. I believe in the established order of things. You, Mr. Regan, are morally obligated to see that justice is done. Age every do we have. Man, they can't all make sense. Gentlemen! Enough of this childish quibbling. I assure you, you are going to take my case. We took the little man's case. We took it with cash in advance and both fingers crossed. The lion fumbled for his fountain pen while McMurray calmly waited with his open checkbook. There was only one place for me to go. The police. They tell me you were looking for me, Regan. Right, Lieutenant Candid, just the man I was looking for. What's her name? Ah, this time it's a him. Jonathan McMurray. Never heard of him. Well, it happened three years ago. Claims he shot his wife. Never heard of him. Wife's name was Lois. Interior decorator. Oh, yeah. Blonde, about 5'5", five, five, blue eyes, age 28, weight 116. I remember... You met her? Nope. That was the description the husband filed with us yesterday when he came in. When you told me her name, I remembered. Sure. Sure you did, Candid. The Regan guys are a dime a dozen around a police station. But dames with nice measurements? Oh, that's something else. Why didn't you book him, Candid? Book him for what? The murder of his wife. Believe that nuts story? Are you kidding, Regan? Do I look like I've been on the force that long? Candid, a man comes to you and confesses to a three-year-old murder. He's got a motive and a complete story, and you turn him away. Oh, take it easy, Regan. Mr. McMurray may like the coziness of the gas chamber, but it takes more than that to spend the taxpayer's money sending him there. Like what? Like a corpus delecti. A body. You should excuse the expression. No body? Regan, Lois McMurray, the little man's wife, disappeared three years ago. We can get at least two witnesses who say that when she got on the boat for South America, she wasn't dead. She was very much alive. Made sense. Sure, real fine sense. Candid told me his witnesses. One, Howard Nelson Whitmore, interior decorator extraordinary, the missing woman's ex-boss. The other witness, Mrs. Nelson Whitmore. They'd been with Lois McMurray the day she'd sailed. That was April 4th the day after McMurray claimed he'd killed her. When a client buys a hundred bucks worth, you give him a hundred bucks worth. I checked the address of Howard Nelson Whitmore and drove out. Robertson Boulevard, Beverly Hills. It was chocolate brown and chalk white, and twisted plywood and copper wire hanging from the ceilings. Average family could live a year on the cost of one month's rent. How do you do? May I help you, sir? Like to see Mr. Whitmore. You mean Mr. Nelson Whitmore. It's hyphenated, you know. How wonderful. Could I see Mr. Nelson hyphen Whitmore? Oh, didn't I tell you? He's in conference with his wife. And we won't discuss the matter again, Howard. Is that clear? Well, for the last time, it's absurd. Absolutely absurd. We'll see how absurd it is after it's done, and it will be done, you understand? This is the last time I'll put up with any of your fantastic schemes. Now, get out! You lame brain nincompoop ought to... Well... Hello. Uh, hello. Where did you come from, stranger? You're Mrs. Nelson Whitmore? For the time being, but then, of course, all things change. You know that, don't you? Sure, sure, all things change. Maybe you and I could talk about that. Oh, I'm sure we could, Mr. Um... Regan. Jeff Regan. I'm sure we could, Mr. Regan. My God. 
I'll be at home in an hour. Encino, just off Ventura. You can't miss it. She was medium size and red hair and... and medium size and red hair. She drifted out of the place like a pneumatic cloud looking for a bolt of lightning. The secretary watched her leave and swallowed a couple of times and looked at me and swallowed a couple of times. You, uh, you may go in now, Mr. Regan. I went in. Mr. Howard Nelson Whitmore looked florid behind his desk, his face flushed and his eyes liquid anger. He was holding a long steel letter opener, which he tapped steadily against the desk. My uh, secretary said you wished to speak to me, Mr. Regan. Well, uh, maybe, uh, maybe I ought to come back later. You can discuss whatever you wish to discuss right now. Your wife always liked that? I said we could discuss your business now. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, old man. Forget it. It's just, just that sometimes, sometimes she drives me nearly out of my mind with her schemes, her stupid, idiotic schemes. Like what? And we have a small orange grove out in Encino. I shouldn't say grow, really. Only ten trees. She uh, doesn't like oranges? No, she wants them moved. Can you imagine that? She wants those ten trees uprooted and transplanted to some other part of our land. She says they'll blend into the landscape better. And you don't think so? Of course I don't think so. Planted those trees myself three years ago in the spring. And planted them where they are because... Because... Well, because that's where they belong. Trees belong certain places, is that it? I will not have you questioning me this way. I planted those orange trees where I wanted them planted, and that's that. They've been there for three years, and they'll stay there. Okay, okay, Mr. Nelson Whitmore. They're your oranges, and it's your land. I, I, I don't know what's gotten into me, Mr. Regan, letting a few orange trees have set me this way. It, it's just that I don't like people digging around my yard. That's a good idea. Never know what they might turn up. What's that? Nothing. I understand you and your wife were with Lois McMurray when she sailed for South America a few years back. No, sir. I said I didn't get the name. Mrs. Jonathan McMurray. Lois. Used to work for you. I, I, yes. Yes, of course. It's been so long since, since she left us. Uh, for South America, that is. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, for South America. Yes, my wife and I went with her to the boat. Funny thing. Um, you know, her husband claims she's dead. Her husband? Jonathan McMurray. Yes, of course, the architect. Wondering idiot if ever I met one. You like people, don't you? I like decent people, not narrow-minded biggers like that McMurray fellow. He's still living in the dark ages. Now, but as far as his wife's concerned, uh, Lois, uh, she's gone. Out of the country. Yes. As far as I know, it was three years ago. Yes. Three years ago this week. Maybe there's more. More? What else do you mean, Mr. Regan? More that you know that you aren't telling me? Like, why did she suddenly leave for South America? <clears throat> Mrs. McMurray sailed to South America with... with an admirer. In other words, she ran out on her husband. Precisely. Not that I could blame the poor girl. McMurray never gave her a divorce. She was literally forced into it. Mm -hmm, it all fits. Except for one little item. Yes? McMurray claims he shot his wife on April 3rd. You claim she sailed for South America April 4th. Somebody's lying. <laughs> Somebody was lying. A decorator named Nelson Whitmore, or an architect named McMurray. Or maybe it was a bigger switch. Both of them lying. Maybe the answer to that one would be with a fire-breathing redhead named Mrs. Nelson Whitmore. She'd said she'd be home in Encino. It was an invite I wasn't going to pass up. I got out there around 5.30, the sun dropping down behind the valley hills, the grass around the place soft and moist and the ten orange trees lining the driveway to Mrs. Nelson Whitmore's house. It was redwood siding, sprawling over a hillside, weaving around like a giant snake. Ranch-type for millionaires. Complete with gravel driveway, four-car garage, and swimming pool. I rang the doorbell. Hello, Mr. Regan. I knew you were too intelligent to turn down my invitation. Red hair, red dressing gown... Same texture. Soft and silky. A film of expensive gauze covering golden tan skin. This way, Mr. Regan. The drinks are mixed. You thought of everything. If we don't think of ourselves, no one else will. Why does that sound like a bromide? Sit here. Nice furniture. 
Herman Miller, Mr. Regan. Foam rubber throughout. You didn't come to discuss furniture, did you? I came to discuss a friend of yours, Mrs. Claire. Her name's Lois. Lois McMurray. Hmm? Lois McMurray. You know her. Quit stalling. Am I stalling, Jeff? Can't take you that long to think up an answer. Why do you want those orange trees moved? <laughs> Your mind does travel, doesn't it? That's still no answer. Oh, very well, Jeff. You're being a cad, you know, a real cad. I get paid to be a cad. You're a private detective? I thought so. Look, Claire, there's a big fancy game in progress. Somebody's playing somebody else for a sap. I get paid to find out who. By the hour. That must make you terribly expensive, Jeff, who paid you. Uh Uh-uh. Wrong pitch, lady. Give me answers instead. Have it your way. I want the orange trees moved because I want them moved. I don't have to answer for that to you or to my husband. It couldn't be because you think there's something under the ground you ought to know about. Oh, what a fantastic idea. Keep talking. I won't be questioned this way. Do you hear? Lois McMurray didn't leave on any boat for South America, did she? Get out. You and your husband are lying, aren't you? Get out of my house! I got out. Out of the Redwood Mansion out down the gravel driveway past the orange trees toward my car when it happened. (coughs) Inside the living room, the smell of cordite, and behind the thick blue clouds stood Mrs. Claire Nelson Whitmore. Stood staring at me, a dazed look on her face, a gun hanging limp in her hand. At her feet, the haughty little man named Jonathan McMurray, dead. Claire Nelson Whitmore looked at me, blinked twice, then collapsed unconscious at my feet. It started when the lion and I were hired by a self-righteous little man named Jonathan McMurray. He claimed he'd shot his wife three years ago and wanted us to prove it. Only I met an interior decorator and his wife, who claimed they'd seen the McMurray woman leave on a boat for South America, very much alive. The only thing that made sense was that I was standing in the living room of the decorator's wife, Claire Nelson Whitmore, and she was lying unconscious at my feet. And next to her was my client, Jonathan McMurray, Not unconscious. Dead. I called Lieutenant Cantor down to police headquarters and waited for Claire Nelson Whitmore to supply some answers. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. You killed McMurray? He he came at me after you left the house. He came through the back door. He had a gun. You had a gun? I was frightened. Just before you got here this afternoon, I, I heard a noise. I thought it was a truck backfiring from the highway. But it scared you enough to get a gun. He shot first. Mr. Regan, he shot first. He shot and missed, and then you fired back. I had to, Mr. Regan. I had to. It was self-defense. There's two guns on the floor, Claire. Yours and McMurray's. Both of them hot. The police will decide. Police? Police? Well, you could save some time by talking now. Jeff, Jeff, I'm confused. I'm terribly confused. I don't know where to turn. Well, that makes sense. I, I, I didn't mean anything earlier today. I, I didn't mean anything, Jeff. All in fun. A great big pitch like that. All in fun. It was self-defense. I shot him in self-defense. Police. Oh, Jeff, you got to believe me. Uh-uh, not me, lady. The police. They're the ones who got to believe you. <laughs> Lieutenant Candid came in with a photographer and three detectives. An ambulance showed up a couple of minutes after that with a medic and two stretcher bearers. I gave Cantor the whole story, the business about the orange trees included. He listened, nodded for one of the detectives to take notes, and then told me to stick around. He and another guy went into Claire Nelson Whitmore. Ten minutes later, he came back out. There's a near collapse. Couldn't get much, Regan. I thought maybe. The dead man's gun had been fired twice, and hers three times. She wasn't hit, Regan. She didn't say anything about McMurray's wife, Lois. Nope. Nothing you hadn't already told me. Uh, just one thing bothers me, Regan. Just one thing? Those orange trees. Why does she want to move? No, she says they look better somewhere else. You think it's as simple as that? I don't think anymore. I gave it up when McMurray hired me. 
If you're looking for logic in this one, Candid, forget it. Um, she's an awful good-looking dame, Regan. Yeah? Mm, I'm partial to redheads. Sure. Redheads and oranges. Regan, I think I'm going to dig for oranges. You figure it that way, huh? Lois McMurray disappeared three years ago, and that's when the orange trees were planted. Howard Nelson Whitmore, the redhead's husband, made a special point of telling me that, Candid. Oh, now, Regan. He laid it out like a bad joke in a comedy routine. You mean you think he deliberately wants us to Look, think Candid, that... you dig. I'll try another idea. Okay, Regan. I'll dig. Candid called the city, and the city sent out the diggers. Maybe I was off base. Maybe I'd had too many weird stories for one day. But the orange tree routine smelled as phony as Limburger in a perfume shop. I called my boss, the lion. Anthony J. Lyon, detective agency. Anthony Me, J. Fatso. Get your pencil. Jeffrey, I've been trying to get in touch with you. Okay, you have. Hey, Jeffrey, that McMurray fella called here about two hours ago. What? Uh, Jonathan McMurray. He told me to tell you to forget everything. He told you that? Uh, he said something about going back to San Francisco, that uh, divine law would right the wrongs or something like that. Lyon, are you sure? Is something wrong, Jeffrey? Just one little thing, Fatso. McMurray's here with me now. Oh, good. I, I wanted to ask him about... Dead, some... Fatso. Well, tell him for me... You're dead? No. Yeah. Now, listen, Lion, I've got an idea. I'll need your help. I want a complete check on Lois McMurray, Jonathan's wife. I want to know uh, where she was born, how many kids in the family, if her parents are living, where she met her husband, hey, Jeffrey, everything. Jeffrey, are you out of your mind? Our client's dead, and besides... Don't argue, Fatso. Just get busy. Yeah, but Jeffrey... McMurray gets his money worth, Fatso, dead or alive. I went outside. Candid was watching the diggers. How many trees, Candid? Well, we dug up four of them. Six to go. Find anything? Dirt. Still hopeful, huh? Still hopeful. I called Howard Nelson Whitmore's office. He'd left there a couple of hours ago. Just after you did, his secretary said. <laughs> Think he left for points south? I don't know, Regan. I don't like it. Any of it. Mm -hmm. Except the redhead. You're partial to redheads, remember? I'm looking for a blonde now. A deceased blonde. Who left for South America. You told me about it. All right, so maybe she didn't leave for South America. Maybe she's dead, Regan. Dead and buried. Buried under one of those orange trees. Oh, that's a good guess. You got anything better to offer? Nope. See you around, Candid. That's when I got an idea. A halfway idea that kept growing until it was a big, full-blooded, 100% idea. Claire Nelson Whitmore said she'd heard a noise, like a truck backfire from the highway. She said that's why she'd gotten out the gun. Maybe she was telling the truth. Maybe there was one story in the Tangle of Lies you could believe. I decided to believe it, and that was an answer in itself. Behind the house, the garage was built for four cars. It was loaded. Servants' quarters, and then... Over a couple of yards, swimming pool. I headed that way, checking the garage, trying the door to the servants' quarters, finding bushes, shrubs, with nothing behind them. Up the hill, the swimming pool. Quiet. Still, like a mirage in the desert. Emerald pool, tile and brick. Oval-shaped. Expensive. Claire wasn't lying. She'd heard that noise. I found her husband, Howard Nelson Whitmore, in the swimming pool. In the swimming pool with a hole in his back. Candid and his boys puffed up the hill to the pool in a hurry when they caught my signal. And I went down, down to the house, to the room of Claire Nelson Whitmore. Jeff. Don't get up, lady. You and I are going to have words. But, Jeff, you know how bad I feel. Yeah, you may feel worse. The police said I could rest. Yeah, that was before they found your husband dead in the swimming pool. Hey, what? You didn't know about that, huh? Howard, oh, Miss Whit... When they pulled him out, they found a bullet in his back. Oh, no. Oh, no, Jeff. I, I didn't do it. I, I didn't do it. There's no answer, lady. The whole thing comes in one big package. You tied the ribbon on it. Give me the phone. No, Jeff, no. I didn't do it. I can tell you a few it. things, baby, but I want to be sure. Real sure. But, Jeff, I... Just give me the phone. Yes, Jeff? The phone? Oh. I gave the operator the number, and the red-headed woman sat frightened on the bed while I talked. 
Her eyes looked at me, cutting deep, staring through the tension, knowing what was happening and hoping it wouldn't happen. I got the lion, and I got my answer, while the red-headed woman sat staring at me on the bed. Dad, what... What did you find out? About Lois McMurray? Hmm? What I thought I'd find out. That she's from Chicago. She has no brothers or sisters. That her parents are both dead. She's alive. Yeah. She's alive. And Jeff, what does it matter about her? Lois McMurray met Jonathan in Chicago. Just after she got out of prison. McMurray made her his project for the year. Salvation, his version of it. She married him. She married him. Because she didn't know what else to do. She married him because girls with prison records don't have a lot of choice. She married him and he converted her. Go on, Jim. He taught her to live a decent life, as he called it. She was his project, remember? The straight and narrow. She didn't love him. She never loved him. Who could? But she was a confused woman. She needed something, somebody. She got little Jonathan McMurray, crackpot crusader. Oh, she got him, Jim. And she learned to hate him. Hate everything about him. Hate his pettiness, his cruelty, his self-righteous conceit. But he wouldn't give her a divorce. That was wrong. She didn't appreciate his good deeds. She hated him, Jeff. She hated him. Yeah, Lois. You hated him. And then you met Howard Nelson Whitmore. He was the opposite of McMurray. Clever, crafty, and in love with you. He cooked up a scheme whereby you could get rid of Jonathan. He framed up that burglar routine. Jonathan fired at a shadow that night three years ago. Only when the lights came on, you were on the floor playing dead. I had to, Jeff. Don't you see? I had to. I, I couldn't stand it anymore living that way, being a prisoner of the man I hated. Anything was better than that. And just like Howard figured, Jonathan ran. He ran a long way. But he came back, Jeff. Why did he have to come back? Because he wanted to make an example of himself. You and Howard spoiled that. You were alive, not dead. That infuriated him. His one chance in life to be a martyr, and you and Howard ruined it for him. That's why That's he... why he shot Howard and then came after you. Vengeance. The wrath of the righteous. Divine law, he called it. He was going to be a martyr after all. Jeff, you know that I didn't shoot first. You know it was him, Jonathan Mean Hateful. Mrs. Whitmore, the Count Candid wants to see you. Jeff. And when I came around, Howard Nelson Whitmore got scared of his story about seeing Lois leave for South America. He knew he couldn't make it stick, so he tried that orange tree routine while I was in his office. Figured the cops might dig, but they'd never find a body. No corpse, no crime. It's the whole story, lady. You dyed your hair red, no relatives to identify you. You forgot about being Lois McMurray. She's dead, Jim. Please, let her stay dead. All right, Mrs. Whitmore, open up. That's it, Lois. Candid's no dumbbell. If he doesn't know that I... No one knows. But me. I know. I'll testify for you, Lois. But I won't lie for you. All right, open up that door. You've got hands, Candid. Open it up yourself. They took Lois McMurray down to headquarters and got the full story from beginning to end. Sure, she was booked on a couple of accounts, but nowhere in it could they stick a murder charge. (laughs) That made Lieutenant Candid an unhappy man. After all, he figured... Maybe the chief would begin to think he was partial to redheads. When I got to the office the next morning, my boss, Anthony J. Lyon, looked as cheerful as a kid with the measles. Hi, Fatso. Oh, hello, Jeffrey. Nice day, huh, Lyon? Real nice day. Uh, is it, Jeffrey? I, uh, I didn't notice. What's eating you? We just wrapped up a $100 case. Just like that. Yes, Jeffrey, I know. A $100 case. Uh, wait a minute, Fatso. We did get paid, didn't we? McMurray may have been a murderer, but not paying would be something else to him. You know, a sin to cheat. Uh, Yes, Jeffrey. Mr. McMurray didn't plan to cheat us. In fact, he said he'd send me the money later. Later? Look, when I left the office this morning, he had his checkbook out, and you were reaching for your fountain Uh, pen. Jeffrey, I tried to tell you on the phone. Uh, There was a mistake in the contract. Well, he wanted his lawyer to... uh, uh, There was a legal question... Jeffrey, I ran out of ink. (laughs) 
Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written by William Frug and William Fifield, produced and directed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Aron. Bob Stevenson speaking, inviting you to be with us again for more suspense and mystery and adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. ending to that story. Sometimes you need your detective heroes to come out that way. Uh, this was noteworthy for this being a case that even the lion didn't want to touch. But Jeff Regan's curiosity was piqued. Plus, if the guy committed murder, he did want to see that taken care of. All right, well, now it's time to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Michelle, Patreon supporter since May, currently supporting us at the Seamus level of $4 or more per month. Again, thanks so much for your support, Michelle. And that will actually do it for today. A reminder, check out our live voice check over at wisdom.greatdetectives.net tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.